Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Amy Coolidge, and I chair the Arlington Democratic Committee and did nothing to make this all happen. However, I'm the lucky one that gets to tell you a little bit about um, um, who brought you here and give credit where credit is due. Um, as I mentioned, I chair the Arlington Democrat Democratic Committee, and um, as part of our work this year, we made it a point um, to, to, to make a, an important decision about talking about issues. So um, we formed a committee, um, the Issues Committee, and um, they have actually put together over the last year about four different forums. We've had some climate change. There's a real interest on our committee about climate change, um, and we did some um, uh, a, a voter uh, forum as well. But um, we are the committee in this town that is elected every four years by Democrats to um, represent the Democratic Party, and we have two goals, to support the mission and to get Democrats elected. And in a, in a little bit, you're going to get to hear from some of those two electeds, but um, this is the commercial for the Arlington Democratic Committee. So I'm on it, but a whole bunch of people in this room are on it, and I want you to see who they are. So anyone who's on the committee, could you please stand up for us? All right, this is the leadership in this town for the Democratic Party. So if you want to get involved, have a chat with them later. Um, anyway, as I mentioned tonight, our focus is um, to f uh, really take a look at some important piece of legis uh, legislation that two of our legislators are sponsoring um, up at the State House, both uh, Rep. Sean Garbley and uh, Rep. Dave Rogers. Um, who are in the House, there are representatives in the House, um, have prioritized this issue and have been working on some pieces of legislation. So you're going to hear more from them, and they'll be introduced in, in just a minute. Also, I mentioned that we have um, Rep. Rogers and Garbley here, but also wanted to um, thank Cabell Eames. Did I say that right, yeah. your name? Cabell. Like a rabble rouser with a C. Um, she's um, um, working with a very important group called um, Mass Power Forward and, and doing some good work. You can do good work without being elected to do it, but the electeds really appreciate when some of these groups are there either um, supporting or agonizing or organizing. So um, they're doing some great work, and you're going to hear about that tonight. Um, speaking of good work, there are a bunch of other good groups. want to give a shout out to Mothers Out Front from Arlington and the 350 Massachusetts. Um, they've got some literature in the f in, um, on the table in the front, so if you hadn't had a chance to look at it on your way out, um, please. Adam McNeil from the Arlington Democratic Committee is going to be our moderator tonight, and I'm going to hand it over to him. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Hello. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Amy, for setting the stage. And of course, thank you to the excellent speakers we have arranged tonight. Uh, we are so glad that you can all be with us tonight for this forum on climate change legislation. I'm sure that everyone here is aware of the enormous impact right now of climate change and its growing effects. Our focus tonight is on important and impactful state level actions to combat climate change. But I do think it is important to briefly center why we are fighting this. When we look across the country and across the world, it is more apt than ever to say we're facing climate destruction, climate emergency, and even climate crisis. Unimaginable wildfires in California and Australia, destructive hurricanes in New Orleans, Houston, Puerto Rico, typhoons in the Philippines and Indonesia, wars accelerated by climate change and desertification in the Middle East, and even in our own neighborhoods, we see mosquito-borne diseases proliferate and our physical infrastructure take more strain every year. The crisis is intersectional, universal, and international. And each individual life seems small against 8 billion people and the world we live in. But here in Massachusetts, we have a real actionable ability to make significant strides in our non-negligible statewide impact. And as a leader, as an example for other states internationally, and hopefully soon, our national government. It takes relatively few committed people to massively change society. And we are absolutely not alone in this. I encourage everyone to take personal action, such as opting up to 100% local renewable energy through the town CCA, if you live in Arlington, and most of Massachusetts has similar programs. Um, 
to explore activism groups that might interest you, and there are many varied ones, including some wonderful ones tabling tonight, uh, and to engage with the legislative members and elected officials of, of all stripes. That last point can be intimidating, uh, but a single informed and heartfelt letter, email, or phone call can have a significant impact, more than you might think entering it, and that's why we have organized this forum tonight, so you can be informed on this. Um, we'll start on a positive note. Historically, the Massachusetts legislature has been one of the most forward-looking legislators across the country to working to address climate change, and Representative Dave Rogers will start off this evening talking about some of the issues our legislator has addressed and some of the bills it has already passed. Dave Rogers is represented for the 24th Middlesex District, a district that includes Belmont and parts of Arlington and Cambridge. Dave has been a strong progressive leader across issues and very much so in the climate crisis. We're glad to have Dave here tonight. Well, welcome everybody. What a great turnout. Uh, it's wonderful to be here and thank you for your presence and your advocacy. Um, I often say that, um, you know, my work as a representative isn't worth a lot unless I have the energy and the, the enthusiasm behind me. And I take that with me down to the State House. So your presence here is, is really appreciated. Uh, I want to thank Adam for the introduction and for his remarks, and of course Amy Coolidge, the leader of the Arlington Democrats, and everything that she does uh, for the Democratic Party and for Arlington in general. I would echo what Adam said about the climate crisis. I don't think we need to, I need to expand on that very much. Your presence here alone tells me how much you care. Um, you know, and the data keeps getting worse. Um, 13 federal agencies a little while back published uh, da uh, sh published data showing an acceleration. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change from the UN, almost concurrently, uh, very close in proximity to when the federal agencies published data, also published frightening data. And um, so, um, particularly with what's going on in Washington and the American government pulling out of the Paris Climate Accord, and more importantly, really, the rolling back of the Clean Power Plan, because the, the Paris Climate Accord was really aspirational and left to the member states how they were going to achieve the goals set out in the accord. The way the United States primarily was going to reach those goals was under the Obama administration's Clean Power Plan. That plan is being unwound now by the administration in Washington. Um, the problem is so overwhelming that we really need federal action. And, you know, this is, I guess, a nonpartisan event, but um, <laughs> the, 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 uh, you probably don't need me to tell you, but I'll tell you anyway. If you're a climate activist, cares about the environment, the single biggest thing you can do is pour all of your time, all of your energy, all of your money into defeating. Donald Trump. Um, and if that means going to New Hampshire, once we have a nominee and knocking on doors, I've done it for every Democratic nominee for the last I don't know how many years. It's actually kind of fun. You go up there in a bus or a carload of folks. It's usually uh, there's camaraderie. You go out to lunch together and, and build a closer relationship with your friends and your fellow activists. But turning out the vote in New Hampshire, giving money, um, uh, we need the power of the federal government to engage on this issue. With all that said as a backdrop, I'll talk a little bit about um, what we're doing and what we already have done in Massachusetts. Um, and you can keep me on track time-wise and, and let me know how I'm doing. Um, we have uh, undertaken significant action here in the Commonwealth. We always need to be forward-leaning. We always need to be doing more. But we've done a lot. And sometimes when I engage with climate activists and those who care about the environment, um, they're not always aware of, of everything we've done. And um, one thing is we've taken major action on gas leaks. Uh, and the gas leaks are prioritized based on their threat to human safety. So if it's near a school or th uh, where it could explode or, or cause uh, harm to, to humans, uh, we fix that as a priority. But what about more remote leaks? Uh, category four or five leaks that are, that are lower down. We have now passed legislation that forces the utilities to prioritize fixing those leaks and the dangerous methane. 
Uh, in an act relative to solar energy in 2016, we lifted the net metering cap. Um, in the act to promote energy diversity in 2016, we did major legislation to expand wind power and uh, geothermal. We have 800 megawatts going in off our shores, the Vineyard Wind Project. That's being held up by the federal government right now for an environmental review. Uh, but up to 3,200 megawatts has been authorized. And uh, working with my staff, I said, well, when I'm talking to people, I can't say 800 megawatts and leave it at that, because unless they're an electrical engineer or have detailed knowledge, they don't, what does that mean? 800 megawatts is enough to power 400,000 homes. 3,200 megawatts multiplied by four, 1.6 million homes. It's a huge project that's been, been authorized off our shores and puts us at the forefront of wind power in the United States. And I see other states are, are rushing to get in, and that's a competition I'd love to be a part of. So uh, that's important. Um, we have passed legislation to incentivize energy storage. As you know, it, when the wind is blowing and the sun is shining, you get solar and, 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 and you get wind power. But if you can't store it, um, it becomes problematic. And so we have uh, passed a, cle a clean peak standard. It's called the CPS standard, which will incentivize the storage because we tend to use highest levels of energy uh, for instance, at, in the evening when you get home from work, well, there's no sun. So the Clean Peak standard is designed to look at peak usage times and energy storage, so we're using the least dirty fuels at the moments of peak demand. Um, we also include uh, increase the RPS, that's the Renewable Portfolio Standard, that's the percentage uh, mix that utility companies, the IOUs, investor-owned utilities, have to get from clean energy. Um, the push was to get that up to it, uh, increase it 3% every year. We got it to 2. Uh, I advocated for 3, but we still doubled it because it was at 1%. So we went from 1% to 2% on RPS, re the Renewable Portfolio Standard. Um, there's a number of other things um, we passed. This session, we, we passed the Greenworks Bill, which is $1.3 billion. We passed it in the House. It's awaiting action in the Senate. Uh, a billion of which would go to local governments for uh, climate change initiatives, uh, energy efficiency. And um, again, that's over on the Senate side. Um, I've been talking to folks about senators, <laughs> and I hope they'll attach the things they want to do to that bill. Because what I've learned in the legislature is once you have a moving vehicle, it becomes a way to move, to move something. And so We'll see what the Senate does with that bill. Um, and then uh, a priority of mine is the, the DEP. In the Great Recession, uh, the Department of uh, Environmental Protection took massive cuts. Um, we went from 1,200 employees there down to 800, uh, so a significant reduction. And what happened in a recession is representatives fight for schools, they fight for a lot of projects, and as a result, energy projects and the Environmental Protection Agency took a hit. And um, working with like-minded colleagues, we've now gotten huge increases for the DEP in the last two or three years, 10 percent uh, each year. So um, we're also funding, and they, they do incredibly important work on water testing and countless other issues. So um, we're doing a lot of good things. There are many good bills pending this session, so we need to keep the momentum. Um, and, um, and I'll be doing that. And I know we're going to be talking about some of the legislation that's pending right now. I look forward to that conversation and your questions. Uh, with respect to the wind project, what can be done to put it in a position where the moment we get rid of the idiots blocking it, it can go forward immediately? Well, I think. Um, it's being reviewed by, I might get the acronym wrong, BOEM, the Bureau of Energy Management. And um, I believe that they're, lo they're looking at fisheries. You know, these are huge projects in the middle of the ocean. They're looking at fisheries, probably migratory bird patterns. Um, it's funny. I have uh, folks who really care about the environment but are also birders or ornithologists and care a lot about 
wildlife and birds particularly and uh, they don't they're very skeptical of, of wind projects and so um, there is a study how much of it is just legitimate science looking at the fisheries looking at migratory bird patterns versus an agenda coming out of Washington we don't fully know but to answer your question I think as soon as that review is done the project can move forward and I hope it happens soon because the people financing the project with the time value of money yes. are worried about the financing stream for, for Vineyard Wind. I mean, they have investors, they have shareholders, and so that's a factor. We're very pleased to have uh, Cabo Eames with us tonight. Uh, Cabo is a legislative manager and political director for 350 Massachusetts. She's here this evening representing Mass Power Forward which is a massive coalition working on environmental issues across the state. Uh, she'll discuss how the Mass Power Forward Coalition came together, what it hopes to accomplish regarding climate change bills with our legislators in this session. All right, Cabell will share our thoughts with us, and then we'll take a couple questions for the audience. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. And as a vice chair of the Belmont Democratic Town Committee, which is my committee, I'm really appreciative to see this crowd here tonight. Um, because it shows that you all care and it's debate night so I know we're all super anxious to get out the door so I probably won't take 15 minutes but I do want to kind of start from a place of hope before I, I, I get into our bills um, I have been a climate advocate for a really long time it kind of got put on me because of the neighborhood that I grew up in I had Philip Morris on one side of me and DuPont on the other and my mother had multiple sclerosis and there was a lot of other really weird illnesses happening in the neighborhood and so it's one of those things that fell on me when I was in elementary school. And by the time I was in high school, I was doing work with the Sierra Club going door to door and um, have been in every community that I've been in, I have been part of some local kind of climate group that was you know, trying to advocate for recycling or you know, some little small changes so I've seen a lot of progress um, over the last couple of decades, and I'm really happy about that. But what I haven't seen is coalitions coming together, and I haven't necessarily seen um, the youth movement that we have now, and I haven't seen a, a widespread uh, amount of people that really care about climate. When I started working on climate, people thought I was weird. So, and now it's one of these movements that if you're not focused on climate, you're weird. So I'm really thankful for that, and that comes from that's a place of hope for me, and it, and it's why I do this work because I've seen it grow over the last two decades, and I know it's just going to continue. And so the coalition that I'm a part of now, which is Mass Power Forward, that came together, and there are people. It's like Sierra Club, and it's Toxic Action Center, and it's faith-based groups. So it's all different. It's Green Roots, which is environmental justice. It's a huge coalition of groups and, and the reason that they came about was because the legislatures were saying we're hearing a lot of mixed messages here you know you, you want this bill and you want that bill and I don't know how am I going to go back and talk to my people about this and you know I just don't know what to do so the groups decided you know what we're just going to form a huge coalition and we're going to make sure that we're all in sync and we're gonna have phone calls where 30 people are on it and two people talk the whole time. You know, the drill, it kinda works that way sometimes. And we're gonna just try to carry the message on together. And so that's how Mass Power Forward started. And it was about two years ago. And I can tell you that the people that are behind Mass Power Forward are really smart people. And some of them are policy people and some of them are organizers and some of them are reverends and some of them are activists and um, it's, and some of them are young, too. I mean, we have Sunrise. They show up for us as well. And so today we had a Mass Power Forward Lobby Day, and we had nearly 300 people show up. So it was, it was really incredible. And we had a lot of positive reactions, and I know that some of our members met with Sean Garbally over here, and he is a champion for us, as is Dave Rogers. And we have a lot of climate champions in the legislature. So I, there's a lot of hope to be had, but we just have to stick together and we have to keep our thumb on them, right? And that means that's, that's federal too. That's people like Ed Markey. And I know that there's a lot of, I don't, I'm not gonna get too much into that, 
But we do want to pass a Massachusetts Green New Deal next year, and that's something that we're going to be focusing on. And so the people that wrote the Green New Deal, it's kind of important for us that they go back to the Senate because it gives the Republicans ammunition against us to say, maybe it's just not that important. So that's why the climate groups, and that's why 350 has endorsed Markey, because we really want to see a Green New Deal. I know it's the most complex policy in my lifetime, and it gives us all something to hang on nationally. So for Massachusetts, for him to be our senator, that's why the climate groups are 100% behind Markey. It's because the Green New Deal is imperative for us for generations to come. We don't want this being used against us in five years, 10 years, 15 years. So we want to send that message. Mass Power Forward has, we ha I have our bills back there. So what we did today, we had a carbon pricing hearing, which was really cool. We've been waiting for this for about a year. And the room was packed. I went in there, I couldn't stand it. It was like a sauna. There was, I mean, it was so hot in there, there was nowhere to walk. It was really, really fantastic to see so many people show up. And both of these guys over here are co-sponsors. And I want to add that they're actually co-sponsors for all of Mass Power Forward bills, of our priority bills. So, you know, when I say climate champions, we're really lucky to have them. So we basically prioritized five bills. If you look at our sheet and you go on the website, there's like maybe 20 bills. But, you know, that's, that's a lot. But we still want to prioritize the five that we have. So we had hearings in 2019. The only hearing that we had in 2020 was the carbon pricing hearing, which we had today. And it went really well. I want to just reiterate that, how well it did go. And um, when we have a room that's packed like that, and I've been in the room over the years, right, it doesn't, it just keeps getting more and more and more people show up. So that the carbon pricing bill is one of our bills. The other one is renewable energy, which is garbly is the sponsor on with Eldridge and Decker. And I'm going to let him talk about that, but that's a really exciting bill. And we also have environmental justice bills, which I am personally very, very excited about. Environmental justice is one of those issues that, you know, I think of Weymouth, and I think of Saugus, and I think of all Wheelabrator, and, you know, how they just kind of show up wherever they want to show up, and everybody just has to deal with it that lives in the neighborhood, and there's, they have no say. So the environmental justice bill that um, we have, which is, there's two of them, and they're actually in Ways and Means, which is a really good sign. They are, it's Senator um, Eldridge is one of them, and then we, and the reps are Dubois and Madero and Miranda, and uh, Senator um, Domenico, I always, did I pronounce that right? Is it D. Dom D. Domenico, okay, D. Domenico. So these bills would put protections on those communities. There's two environmental justice bills. They're, they're both for protecting communities. They're both putting in the smallest um, provision as language. If, you are, if you're in Chelsea and you want to put a site in Chelsea, you better have all of that information in Spanish. And you better have a community hearing that's at a time when everybody can show up. So there, there are small things like that that don't exist right now, which is why these things just kind of show up where they do and no one can say boo about it. So we have the two environmental justice bills, they're in ways and means. The re renewable energy bill is still in the telecommunications utilities and energy committee. So we need to get that out. So I've got some action steps, but that will be later. And the TUE, so carbon is in TUE. And then there's another one that's around t TCI. Now, I'm sure, how many people have been hearing about TCI? Right. So TCI, Transportation Climate Initiative, and it is to kind of mobilize mid-Atlantic states to all kind of decide on a gas tax, basically, and how they're going to fund their infrastructure because if you, gas taxes by law have to be put back into transportation. So there's no fighting over where that money goes. So the governor right now is in charge of how that all rolls out. And we have a bill that's, a, it's Lesser and Eldridge that have the bill, and it's um, Eldridge, sorry, not Eldridge, but Eldridge. And again, all of these papers are in the back because they're kind of weedy, if, if you want to take them before you leave. And this would uh, employ a commission, not the governor, but a commission gets to decide 
how this money is spent because there's some equity issues, which is around, you know, how, it, let's think of last summer when the tea fair went up. And I thought, great. So you're gonna, you need to pay for the tea. Something caught on fire, great. So everybody that takes the tea, which depends on the tea, now has to pay a, a, an extra fee and there's nothing that we can do about it. So there are a lot of equity um, provisions in all of these bills that say, you know, if you're a certain income, you cannot put it on those people. You have to figure out another way or you have to give it back. The carbon pricing bill, there's a rebate. 70% of that money goes back to the households. So some of these bills have those provisions in them. Um, and so I just, um, yeah, I guess I'll take questions now, but I have action steps for you and Thank you. If anyone has a question, come up to the microphone over here. I'm just, can I just ask, sure. when you say carbon pricing bill, are you talking about the Benson bill? Or yes. The so the Benson bill, that's a good, thank you. So first of all, Benson is gone. So Driscoll has it now and he's from Milton and he had a really strong testimony today. Um, Barrett. So this is kind of the, the, the fight that, I, that I've seen with the carbon pricing bill because I was with 350 three years ago when we were championing Barrett's carbon pricing bill. The problem with that bill going forward is that there is no um, equity in it. It doesn't go back, there was no provision in it that it would 70% of that would go back to families. So whereas the Benson bill had it in there, which is now the, Dris the Driscoll bill, but that had all of those um, sorts of rebates in that bill. So, you know, Barrett is, he, um, he thinks that carbon pricing is kind of his thing. He introduced it, I think maybe six years ago. And so he really wants to have ownership of that. So it's been really hard. He was upset with the coalition that we went over to the house and was working with Benson on it. He felt abandoned and, you know, so <laughs> there's, <laughs> There's some eggshells that we all have to walk on, but um, yeah, so it is the Driscoll bill that is now the carbon bill that we had hearing on today. Did he retire, Barrett? No, no, and he is the chair of TUE, so one of my action steps is that you guys are gonna call him. <laughs> yes. If it's too long of an answer, you can uh, defer the, uh, but um, carbon pricing, which is linked to carbon tax, I assume, is this figure out how to place that? Carbon. Okay. Yes, it's a, it's a price. So, so here's the argument with a carbon price. It's really, this really should come from the federal government. And um, climate, if there, it's CCL, and so it's carbon, I think it's like climate carbon lobby or, no, it's citizens, citizens climate. carbon, yes, citizens thank you. Citizens lobby. climate lobby, thank you. I think that they came about 12, 13 years ago and they've been working at the federal level on carbon pricing and it didn't really go anywhere. And so, you know, now that our federal government is insane, states are trying to take on carbon pricing themselves, but there's a lot of legal problems that we've been hearing that, that could happen. You could implement the bill and then lawyers come out and chew it up and it gets dissipated. So we understand that as, a, as the Carbon Coalition of Mass Power Forward, and what we're really fighting for is a, you know, that we support a carbon fee. So let, you know, we want to send the message that when the federal gods do come up and sweep us all up and enact climate legislation and we all survive and we live happily ever after, carbon was something that we supported. Because when you're talking about fees with legislatures, if they're running for office, that's some, for some it's a suicide mission that you're asking them to do. I mean, you know, you, you do have to understand that they have a whole bunch of constituents and I'm not naive to the fact that not everybody cares about climate like I do. So, and that's something, another action step that I'll tell you about later, but. I, I forgive my naivety, but it's about putting a price on it within the state. Within the state. Just the state, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. And Thank you, Kevo. Uh, so next up, we've got Sean Garbley. Sean Garbley is the state representative for the 23rd Middlesex District, representing Arlington and West Medford. 
he's been a progressive champion for a long time by successfully passing an act for Social S Worker Safety Act, an act mandating uh, insurance coveraging for hearing aids for children, an act for online voter registration, an act banning tobacco products at pharmacies, uh, and work or restorative work statewide, and very much so on climate. And he's going to come up to talk about a bill that Cabell mentioned um, that he sponsored. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. The fact that you're here proves that you care about this issue. And there are a lot of issues that we debate at the State House from education to higher education to health and human services. To me, this session, actually for the last couple of sessions, there is no issue more important to sur the survival of our species and our planet than climate change. So first, let me just thank the Issues Committee so much, uh, the Arlington Democrat Town Committee, for putting this event on very appreciative, and I want to thank my partners as well on the panel, uh, 350, I can't say enough good things um, about what your organization stands for. We have many 350 members here in Arlington who are so passionate and advocate incredibly uh, at the State House. So it's just tremendous to be a partner with all of you, and I do also want to thank my colleague, Rep. Rogers, for being the climate champion at the State House as well, and specifically for his work around DEP uh, in the budget. It's uh, very, very important when the economy collapsed in 2009, it was very difficult to restore the funds for DEP. And he really led the effort when he was elected uh, to the House, I forget the year, but when he was elected, he really <coughs> made it um, his priority. So thank you so much. Um, I am proud. Give him a clap. Absolutely. So I am proud to work with so many in the legislature. We have over 100 co-sponsors in an act to repower Massachusetts to 100% renewable energy by 2045. So I want to highlight the bill, why it's important, um, and then take your questions. But first, um, this past weekend, many of us were in New Hampshire campaigning. It was around 75 degrees. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that's, nor that's not normal. It's not normal. And it, it's funny, we can laugh because people are outside, but it's not funny. It's dangerous, it's scary, of the future of our planet literally is in jeopardy. Um, our moderator started very eloquently in pointing to the climate-related events in Australia, the Gulf Coast of this country, the western part of this country, uh, the epic tornado um, events that have happened in record numbers over the last 10 years. Um, we are very close to uh, the last opportunity we have as human beings in this country to stop this crisis. And to me, it can only be done with bold energy legislation at the state level. When our president pulled, when Donald Trump pulled out of the Paris Agreement, uh, he said to the whole world that climate change is a myth, right? and that states really have to go in on this alone. And that's exactly what states did. States from California, New Mexico, Hawaii, just recently New York have passed ambitious climate legislation proposals uh, that move us to 100% renewable energy. Massachusetts, even though I would agree we have done some great things. I was proud to vote for the original Global Warming Solutions Act back in 2009, which set the stage for ambitious climate legislation. But we have lagged far too long from other states uh, to really address this issue seriously. And the only way we address it seriously, quite honestly, is to pass a comprehensive piece of legislation. But my bill, 100% Renewable Energy, will call for all areas to move to 100% renewable energy by 2045. That's home heating, that's transportation, that's all sectors. There's also a provision in that bill around utilities. We're moving to 100% renewable energy by increasing the RPS uh, by 2035. So those are the targets. And we mandate DOER, the Division of Environmental Resources, to set standards and promulgate regulations Okay, by 2030 and 2040 
to make sure the administration, whoever is the governor at that time, uh, keeps the mandate for moving us in the direction for 100% renewable energy. That is what this bill does. It is an incredibly exciting piece of legislation. We have over 100 members of the House and the Senate who have signed on to it. It's an ambitious proposal. Um, there might be a question that comes up a little later, so I want to answer it right now because it's the truth, um, and I need all of your help to, to fight against it. Uh, and that is, why hasn't this legislation passed? That's the question I get all the time, and the reason I get that question is because there's over 100 co-sponsors, right? There's 200 members of the legislature. So if you have over 100 co-sponsors, why hasn't this bill passed? And that is, if this legislation passes, there will be a whole lot of people who lose a lot of money, right? Primarily utility companies from Eversource to National Grid. So they are doing everything they possibly can and spending millions of dollars to stop this bill at the State House, as well as a number of other bills. And that's the truth. Those are the facts. I can't color it as clear um, as that. So we need everybody to continue to fight for this bill, to fight for the environmental justice bill, to fight for the carbon pricing bill. Uh, and you do that by meeting with your legislators. If I'm not your legislator, if Dave Rogers isn't your legislator, and you haven't called your legislature, call them, get to know them, and ask them not just to support this bill, but be a champion of it, to be a climate change champion. And what that means is you go to Speaker DeLeo, you go to Senate President Spilka, and you say to them that you want them to bring these bills to the floor for a vote. Quite honestly, anyone can sign a piece of paper to say you support it, right? It's very easy to sign a piece of paper and say, I support this bill. But what are you actually doing to get this bill to the floor of the House, the floor of the Senate, and to Governor Baker's desk? So I will leave you at that. I look forward to your questions, and thanks so much for being here. Uh, does anyone have any questions for uh, Representative Garbalians? Yes, please. I'd like to ask you, what is the influence that the uh, utilities have with these particular, sounds like you were saying particular legislators are being influenced by these utilities. Right. In what manner are they being influenced and, and why is DeLeo right. involved with that? Well, I'm not naming Bob DeLeo. I think there's a whole host of legislators, but I think right. what you should do is look in the Office of Campaign Political Finance and see where okay. donations get contributed to. Okay. I don't know. You know this okay. is not something I've done, um, but I hope you do it. I've been spending my time meeting with legislators all across the Commonwealth trying to get them to support the bill and trying to get them to go to the speaker, go to the Senate president. The bill hasn't passed either chamber, so I don't want to lay blame on, on either branch. Um, but we have to do what we, we have to fight because this issue is so severe. We need to pass a comprehensive bill similar to California, similar to the one that New York just passed. Uh, there is a reason these bills uh, aren't getting passed, and so I'm doing everything I can um, to push them through. But I honestly believe the reason they haven't passed is because of the influence of some of these companies on the decision making um, on, on Beacon Hill. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Yes, any, any suggestions about how to bring some pressure to bear on the utilities? Um, I work in, in the investment realm and I've organized a number of people I'm part of a group that's organizing people to divest from fossil fuel industry and yes, related absolutely. supporting industries. So. Right, and I have to say too, you also mentioned the exciting prospect of wind. Yes. Um, so this past August, I took a trip, as, as you know, with several legislators to Denmark, where we met with Orsted, and, and uh, Representative Rogers mentioned this, where we toured <coughs> the over 100 turb wind turbine farm. It is absolutely amazing. Um, so two pieces of legislation that we talk about a lot as pieces of, uh, actually, laws that we've helped pass that we're really proud of. One would be um, the criminal justice reform bill, 
and one would be the Student Opportunity Act, which reinvests at $1.5 billion, right? These two bills we celebrate today. Um, but I can tell you, from being in the legislature since 2008, back then these were seen as impossible to pass. The criminal justice reform bill was seen as impossible to pass because we had district attorneys across Massachusetts going into offices and demanding that we not touch minimum mandatory sentence reform, that we don't touch restorative justice, that we don't touch pretrial bail reform. Um, and most of the legislators listened to the DAs. And then there was a growing movement, right? There was a growing movement across this state to elect more progressive forward-thinking district attorneys and activists to really look at you know, reforming minimum, minimum mandatory sentencing. And that's what we did, that's what we passed. And 10 years ago, it was seen as that's never going to happen. So I look at this issue similar to that in terms of the influence. And that is, as was mentioned, we had 300 people in the State House today going from office to office. And I think the demand needs to be clear on our, on our elected officials, and that is there's other people running for office. We can choose to vote for them as well. We want you to make this your top priority. And I'm optimistic that, that we will. There was another question. Um, I have two questions. Um, one is, um, what are the arguments being used against this bill? And I think I missed something you said. Does this also apply to like um, uh, heating in the home? Or yes. how are we going to mandate that people yep. have to switch to yep. electric heat pumps? Yep. No, it's. Um, so let's talk first about the, the opposition. Um, so what the opposition will say is that this is unrealistic, the technology is not there, this should be something that's done at the federal level, we shouldn't do it here in, in, in Massachusetts. Um, I'm trying to think what, what else I've heard. I've, I've heard that uh, this is pie in the sky, that the one argument that I have heard that utility companies have made is that this is going to hurt people living in poverty. Yeah. Yeah. That's, what, that's what I have heard. Because they, will have to because they will have to convert their home heating. So this is something that is important. Obviously, we do not want this uh, enacting this legislation to have a detrimental impact on the poorest among us in the Commonwealth. So one of the things that the bill does do, and these would be regulations promulgated by Division of Environmental Resources, the department, right? Within the bill would set up a fund, right, to help the poorest among us. It would be an income, um, an income driven pool where people can apply for a set of money that would be used to help them to convert. To me, that's the most important thing that we can do to help people who are living on a certain income <coughs> afford to make this switch and also try to push back against the argument. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing the bill does do is try to make sure that as we move, now th the, the home heating switch would come by 2045. So we don't necessarily know the technologies that will be available mm -hmm. and that's one of the things that this bill sets up to uh, have a DOER evaluate in three different times between now, well, when the bill gets enacted, to 2045, how to implement this. Um, but one of the th other things that the bill does do is as jobs get lost, right, because of the change to 100% renewable energy, that those individuals would be the first in line to get retrained and be able to apply for those jobs that um, come because of this bill and the other bills as well. What is the uh, rough, and again, thank God, rough schedule and timeline milestones, I guess you could say. What, what, what is the target of 2035? The target of 2040, the target of 2045. Is there, a, is there a set of milestones? Not in the legislation. Um, okay. You know, I think we need to be realistic. If you don't count nuclear right now, Massachusetts only, I believe, is around 6%, 5 6% renewables right now. So we're far way off. And so um, that's why I believe this bill is so important to pass. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, oh, floor talk. What's your right. first? Yeah, floor talk. Um, yeah. Logistically, you know, everything has to come out of committee the first week of February. What do you think the chances are of getting the same thing <coughs> some kind of discussion in our panel? So I met with the speaker two weeks ago on the bill. I, you know, he did not commit. Um, he's meeting with a lot of legislators. I'm sure he, he met with Rep. Rogers as well as we try to prioritize our legislation. Um, I'm working as hard as I can to get it out. And so I'm, uh, one thing I'm asking my colleagues to also support the bill, remember there's over 100 of us, I'm asking them to call the chair of the Telecommunications Committee. I'm asking them to talk to the speaker, to Senate President, and really try to make a push to get this piece of legislation out of committee now. And so I'm, I'm an optimistic person. I'm not going to uh, try to pretend that this is an easy thing to get done, but I'm also not going to stop until they tell me no. How many cycles have you? Uh, this is the, well, it's been a different, so this, this is the second one. It was a different iteration last time. But I think that's important to really kind of show the grassroots movement for climate change. Last session we had, I think, less than 40, maybe 30 people have signed up. Or the first time I filed the bill, we had about 30. And they were from Newton, Brookline, Lexington. See a common theme? Yeah. Now we, over, we have over 100, and they're from Chicopee, Fall River, you know, New Bedford, all over the Commonwealth. And I, I'm not taking credit for that. I'm putting the credit to organizations like 350 and grassroots people who are holding their reps accountable by asking them to sign on the, to, onto the bill. Now I'm asking them to talk to leadership to try to get this bill to the floor before our session ends on July 31st, obviously trying to make that February deadline to get it out of committee. If we can't get it out of committee, one thing I, I, I am asking the chairman is to give the bill an extension order, which will give us more time to make the case why this is so important to pass now. Vic, if you're running this for us to, as citizens, citizens, to call the chairs of these committees, is it to serve the whole state Senate president directly, or is it really through a representative? Well, I'm certainly not going to, what you want to do on your own time, I appreciate the yeah, fact that you're call, energized. Um, I would say if you know somebody, if you're friends with somebody who's as passionate as you are on this issue, who happens to live in another district, your time would be more well spent calling them and asking them to ask their elected official to prioritize this legislation. Okay. Yes. Yes, I was just saying. No, no, no. I'm taking the moderator's job. You're, you're absolutely right. <laughs> you're more efficient that way. This is the first part of these meetings that I've come to, so it's easier if it's a dumb question, but no, dumb with, with all we hear about the emergency, what is the state able to do, like, say, within the next 10 years? Because you're talking about the states that are going right. far away. Right. That's, that's a great question. So I, I was at a, a panel recently, um, and I'm trying to remember the name of it, but it looked at this issue globally, and it measured uh, policy changes that legislators can enact. And it looked at everything from carbon pricing to 100% renewable energy um, to uh, environmental justice bills to a whole host of things to try to lower um, our carbon emissions. And it looked at, you know, if we were, and it looked at uh, lessening the, the degree of heat of the planet, and if we were to enact these bills, how much of an impact would it have? And the truth is, you would have to enact a lot of legislation worldwide to make an impact. And so that's what we're fighting for at the State House. That's why I'm so strongly supportive of um, the carbon pricing bill and the other agenda items of 350 because I think it will at least move in the direction. But right now, 5% you know, renewable energy as a, as a state, right? Um, some people say that it's unrealistic. Some people say you're not accelerating it enough. And I understand that criticism. Um, but that's why I want to get it in statute. And once it is in statute and the plan uh, is up for implementation, then we can look at trying to hurry it up, hurry the schedule up. I think there was one more. I think we have time for one more question, so back there. Yes. 
Um, I just wanted to ask you, uh, do you think honestly that all the work that we do, the grad students, uh, is going to move this bill forward? And is it, what is it that pushes the opposition to relent? And the, re the reason I ask that is I was It's a good question. Yeah. I was working a lot with the AVR, the yeah. automatic, uh, what is it? Yeah. Which had, if you knew what it, it would do, you wouldn't have any opposition. No I mean, opposition. it sounded like common sense. It took us over three and a half years right. to get it, the Leo, to present it. And once it presented, it just passed the final colors. So I'm asking myself, what is it? Mm. Other than money. I know money is there somewhere. But is money so strong that they just, no matter what we do, I mean, we had so many people go up there and speak to them, students everywhere, and it just took a very long time. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the most frustrating things of being a legislator, is that things take a long time, right? Um, but it did get passed. Right? It did. <laughs> it did take but a long I time. I don't understand what was right. the opposition, except for those people I don't want 800,000 right. people who are on the roll or on the government to sure. vote because they're not going to vote for me. Sure. I figured, well, that may be the reason. But yeah. So. Um, they weren't the Democrats. I right. So I, I share your frustration. So I filed the bill in 2008 to mandate insurance companies to cover the cost of hearing aids for kids. And we had 300 kids who needed hearing aids come to the state house and testify. Okay? It took six years to get the bill passed for a relatively small cost to the insurance companies to cover the cost of hearing aids. And here's a shocker um, that I, I kind of got, well, it got me pretty angry. I wrote a letter to some of the, one of the insurance companies and I said, could you just cover the cost of this child's hearing aid it's a constituent of mine. And they wrote back, we don't cover the cost of jewelry. <laughs> That's what they wrote back. That's what they wrote back. And it took six years to get the bill passed because, because of money. Um, the first part of your question, I think it's the most important thing that makes a difference. And that is the influence of grassroots. Absolutely. We just passed a $1.5 billion investment K through 12 over the next seven years. That would not have happened if families, teachers, didn't go up to the state house and talk about how their child in Chicopee or Lowell or Springfield was less advantaged for a child in a more wealthier community. That wouldn't have happened. And so I think grass, obviously having dedicated legislators like Rep Rogers makes a difference. It really does but you need passionate advocates. And uh, you, you, you know how you mentioned AVR? That wouldn't have happened without you. Three and a half years. Three and a half years. It's frustrating, <laughs> it is, but it's long. So, yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, uh, Harvey, if I could ask a quick, very quick follow-up to that myself. Do you think there's a, say, a strong correlation between how much pressure is put on, how much grassroots pressure, and how quickly that goes through? Is that what I'm hearing out of you? Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it depends on the bill, right? It depends on the legislation. Um, but, but I will say um, it puts it on the radar, right? When legislators receive correspondence from constituents, walk in traffic from constituents like we did today, we had members from 350 knock on my door, come and meet with me, that makes a difference. And if 160 representatives are getting that kind of traffic, mm -hmm. that kind of uh, advocacy on specific legislation, uh, people know us. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, that is obviously an incredibly exciting bill, uh, and a very important one. And uh, Someone mentioned earlier that uh, it appeared Dave Rogers had less time to speak than everyone else, but that's because Representative Rogers is coming back up again now to talk about a few other bills on the, that are on the docket. Thank you. So you've got, we're roughly on time, so you've got about 15, 10, 10 to 15 minutes now. 
I'm back and better than ever. <laughs> so um, I want to, first of all, I, I also want to thank uh, Cavill and uh, for her wonderful work. Um, it's a constituent of mine in Belmont and has really um, made herself a, a force of nature in her advocacy. Uh, she worked on Bob Massey's campaign and now is a legislative advocate for 350 Mass, is doing great work. And my partner in the legislature, Sean Garbley, uh, who, as you can hear and see, is doing tremendous work on climate and other issues. And um, I want to elaborate on a point he made and, and a question from the audience. And I happen to sit next to um, Frank Moran. He's the rep from, from Lawrence. And so, I mean, he literally sits right next to me on the floor. So it's like any other workplace you socialize or talk to people. Who, and um, I said, Frank, you know, do you hear much from your constituents about climate and environment? And he turned to me, he said, Dave, I represent Lawrence. My schools are in receivership. They've been taken over by the state. No, I don't hear a lot about climate. And so what I've tell, been telling advocates for five, six years now, I see Dallin Kless in the back, and who's such a champion on these issues, and, and many of you who talk to me, is in some ways when you talk to me, I used to work at the Environmental Protection Agency in the criminal division, prosecuting polluters. And I worked for a clean energy company. So you're preaching to the converted. I've been in this fight a long, long time. But it's very important, and, I, and, and the hopeful thing that I see is organizations like 350 Mass are now organizing more and more in other districts. And, and that's the key, is that representatives hear from constituents, because it, this is generally a progressive democratic district. Uh, the folks in this district care about this issue. I, I hear a lot about it, but are all my colleagues hearing a lot about it? And they're, they're not always doing that, and that, but that's happening more and more, so that's another reason to be hopeful. Um, the, other, the other reason I think to be hopeful, and, and this is kind of off topic, and then I'll get back on, on track to what I'm supposed to be talking about, is we have, right in Somerville, an amazing, uh, amazing place. It's actually led by Emily Reichert from here in Arlington, and that's Greentown Labs. It's the largest uh, green technology incubator in North America. And after Ed Markey announced the Green New Deal with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in Washington, he wanted to return to his home state to announce the Green New Deal here. And where did he go to do it? Greentown Labs. And I think we were all there with him. Now why, and he, and he makes the point, as much as legislation and the, the role of government in, in legislation <laughs> and regulation we need innovation in the private sector on energy storage. I mean, if you look at Tesla, they're famous for their cars, but Tesla is now huge in, in energy storage. And I've uh, taken tours of Greentown Labs, and you see all these entrepreneurs from, from Harvard and MIT and lots of other schools who are um, full of you know, great ideas. You have venture capitalists who see a chance to make money and see opportunity to create jobs, to create profits. and so. The other thing to keep in mind that we're not talking about so much tonight is the innovations we need from, from the private sector. And uh, as I say, it's led the CEO of Greentown Labs is right here in Arlington, Emily Reichert, and she's, she's phenomenal and doing, doing great work. So I'm going to be talking about uh, a handful of bills that I've been asked to discuss that are pending right now. I talked when I first spoke about what we've already done in the past. And there are two companion pieces of legislation on environmental justice that are incredibly important. And um, one of them uh, is uh, filed by uh, Representative Adrian Madaro. He's from East Boston, an act relative to environmental justice. And the other is filed by Senator Eldridge and Representative Dubois and Representative Miranda, the Environmental Justice Act. And Environmental justice policies already exist under Massachusetts law. The problem is they're in our uh, regulatory law through executive orders. And we have an executive order on the books. Uh, it's in a fact sheet, I think maybe in the back. Um, but it is not being very carefully or strictly followed by state agencies. And there's also another uh, rulemaking from the um, Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, again, 
it doesn't have the force of statutory law. And so the idea is to codify what currently exists as executive orders and give it more teeth. Uh, so uh, those bills, as you heard, are now in, are in uh, ways and means. Um, you know, what is environmental justice? It's the right to be protected from pollution and to live and enjoy a healthful environment regardless, basically, of your zip code, regardless of where you live. So uh, the one bill would look at uh, language. Are there, is it a community with um, folks who don't speak English as a primary language? It looks at income levels uh, in terms of median state income. And finally, it looks at um, the percentage of folks who are, are um, African American, Hispanic American uh, minorities, and then designates them as environmental justice communities. And in so doing, uh, it would limit the number of new facilities that can be built in these places that uh, contain certain toxic chemicals. It will appoint a director of environmental justice at the Energy and Environmental Affairs Department. That's very important, actually have someone who is sort of the captain of the ship who will be following the issues all the time. Um, and so that's a very important bill. The other bill that I referenced that's an environmental justice bill, what, what that does is we have on the books in Massachusetts, MEPA, it's a companion to NEPA. NEPA is the National Environmental Policy Act. MEPA is the Massachusetts Environmental Policy Act. And what it does is any major project by a state agency or that involves state land or state permitting uh, must get a review to understand what are the environmental impacts of that project. And then the permitting agencies that actually issue the permit have an awareness of how they can reduce the environmental impact of those, of those projects. So uh, those bills are both important. And it's important to talk about environmental justice because in the last decade or so, there was almost a, a disconnect or a schism, if you will, between folks pushing for new renewable energy and climate awareness, but not really fighting as much for environmental justice. And let's be honest, we heard some of the towns, Sean rattled them off, Lexington, Newton, Brookline. If you look at a lot of the environmental movement, if we're honest, it's relatively well off white folks. And the perception was in minority communities that those relatively well-off white folks were not really fighting for environmental justice issues. So if we want to build a broad coalition, we really have to care about both of these things. We have to care about big picture climate uh, crisis issues, but we, ha we have to care about our brothers and sisters uh, who may be in neighborhoods and that are not quite as well off. Uh, so those bills are important. I'm pleased to see they're moving. Um, and the next bill I want to talk about is the carbon tax bill, or the carbon emissions bill. That is Rep. Jen Benson. She got a great job offer. Uh, we're happy for her. Sorry to lose her in the legislature. Great leader, uh, chair of the Health Care Finance Committee. Um, but Bill Driscoll from Milton has taken over as the sponsor. Uh, I was at a panel in Cambridge recently where they had folks from the Sunrise Movement and from lots of different environmental groups. And then they had an MIT professor, I don't know if you've heard of him, Christopher Knittel. Uh, he leads their environmental programs at MIT. And he was the last panelist. And he said, folks, I share the same goals as everyone on this panel, the Sunrise folks and everybody else. But until we put a price on carbon, we will never solve this problem as quickly as we need to. And he even talked about uh, the Obama administration's clean power plan. He ref referenced one big piece of that was fuel efficiency standards. And then he got into some very dense math, being a PhD from MIT, but <laughs> some of which went over my head. But basically explained fuel efficiency standards, he said, are about one-seventh or one-sixth as efficient as actually putting a price in the marketplace on carbon. So there are a lot of bright people who think the carbon pricing is the, the key. And um, what her bill would put a, a ton, uh, $20 a ton charge on CO2. And that would increase every year by $5 a month over five years until ultimately it's $40 a month. Uh, I'll, I'll get to you in a second. I just wondered, is this on your piece of paper, the one we're talking about? Yeah. 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 It's 2810, H2810. 2810. Oh, okay. And I have, uh, we can connect after, I'll get you. Some there, there is a back. Well, we that table. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, um, 
And what, what it would do is then take the money and invest 70% um, of it would be rebated to those at the lower income, uh, uh, lower end of the e income spectrum, and 30% would go into an infrastructure fund for, for environmental uh, programs. Um, it's a complicated bill because while there are carbon taxes, when we fill up our tanks, so there's gas tax, there's REGI, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. This would be a system-wide uh, fee on all carbon. And there are very few jurisdictions in the world that have done this. So some of the questions sort of centered on why don't these things happen. Um, there are a lot of reasons, in my opinion. But some of them is wrapping, getting 160 reps and 40 senators to, to wrap their heads around some of these concepts and to implement something that's never really been implemented anywhere else. My understanding, maybe some of you uh, know, Otherwise, but I think British Columbia, the province in Canada, is the only place on earth that has a system-wide carbon tax. So why wouldn't the Massachusetts legislature become the second jurisdiction in the entire planet to have a carbon? Well, th that's a big lift. That's a heavy lift to, to do that. Um, um, but I think it has more momentum than it, than it did in the past. And uh, you know, it can take um, some number of years to move legislation. Um, and in part sometimes because it's complicated. Um, the final bill that uh, I've been asked to speak about um, is, the formal name is filed by Lori Ehrlich. Uh, she's from Swampska. She's, she's wonderful, a great champion on environmental issues. It's an act to advance modern and sustainable solutions for transportation. Uh, many of you heard, uh, have heard about the TCI, the Transportation Climate Initiative, uh, that's being um, advocated for by uh, Charlie Baker, the Baker administration, and a number of other states, although you've probably seen some other states are saying they don't want to do it or they're skeptical. Uh, New Hampshire, their governor said he, he, he wants no part of it. Um, but the idea is that distributors of gas and diesel fuel would purchase allowances, credits, through an auction for each ton of carbon that they emit. And then those funds are expended for uh, climate or energy uh, programs to for energy efficiency, to enhance public transit, to electrify public transit. I have a bill to convert all MBTA buses to electric buses, so I think there'd be money to do that. And what Lori Ehrlich's bill do, does is say, okay, where's all this money going to go and how are we going to make sure that it's spent on what we want it spent on? So it would establish a, a fund uh, to um, distribute the money. It would appoint a 15-person panel with experts on, on energy, the environment, transportation to oversee the spending of the money. Um, it would establish criteria for how pro programs and proposals would be evaluated. And, um, and it would create reporting mechanisms so the public is kept abreast of how we're doing on our goals. So uh, I covered a lot in a short period of time. Uh, I realize, um, but I wanted to get through all of them. Those are four bills that are priorities for 350 Mass, and for many environmental organizations, Sierra Club and, and many others. Um, we're all pushing on them hard. I'm a co-sponsor of all of them, uh, as is Representative Garbley. And, um, you know, I, I'm hopeful. I mean, um, every year since I've been there, we have done some, some significant environmental bill. Again, being forward-leaning, it's never enough when we're facing the crisis that we're facing. But I am very hopeful we're going to do another significant environmental bill this session. Are we going to do all of them? No. Um, but I think we'll, we'll do something meaningful. I'm the chair of a committee for the first time this session. It takes a while in the House to get promoted to that position. And there was a question about process. And um, I'm doing it now. On the, I'm chair of the Cannabis Committee now that <laughs> cannabis is legal. It's going to be a billion dollar industry. There's a lot of legislation that will impact the cannabis industry. And um, I'm sitting with my staff and going through and talking to my Senate counterpart, Sonia Chang Diaz. She's the chair on the Senate side. So chairs of TUE, Telecom Utility and Energy, are doing the same thing. They're going through their bills. They have lawyers and policy analysts to go through them. And um, you can extend the deadline. There is a February deadline, but it can be extended. And, uh, so um, I do know, is this also a bandwidth problem in the legislature? And, and what I mean by that is 
6,000 bills get filed every session on education, on transportation, on public health, on just endless. There's, there's so many areas. So how many bills can we pass? Can we pass 300, 400, 600, 800? There is a limit to how, many new, how much new law society can absorb. I was once in a meeting with the Chair of Ways and Means back when it was Brian Dempsey, and we were problem solving and discussing how to attack an issue. And I said, well, we could do legislation. He recoiled. He's like, legislation, oh God. <laughs> Just because every stakeholder weighs in. It's enormous, it's the opposite of the private sector. I've spent part of my career in the private sector where the need for speed, the need to get to the marketplace, the profit motive, turn that on its head in the legislature. It is, as the phrase I always use, it's deliberate by design. It is deliberately designed to be a very painstaking process. After all, we pass laws that affect the lives of seven million people who live in the Commonwealth. We ought to be careful. But juxtaposed against that, of course, is this climate crisis and the urgent need for action. So um, that's a little bit more about the process as well. So um, that covers the four bills that um, um, I was asked to speak about. And I'm happy to take questions, as I'm sure would be Cavill and Sean. Absolutely. Questions are I think that's Lori Ehrlich's bill on, on basically on heating. A, Enacting utility transition to using renewable energy. Yes. It, um, I believe that's Lori Ehrlich's bill. It has to do with, significantly to do with heat pumps, which I'm trying to learn more about. Um, but um, this is only the first session that's been introduced, I believe. And often when it's the very first time, again, ed legislators are getting educated on it. They're trying to learn about it. Um, I think it's a, it's a great idea, and, um, but I, I don't necessarily see it passing this session because it's so new. It's, it's brand new. I, and I, I am supportive of that bill as well. Uh, I don't know if Brucey is still here. Brucey. Okay. So Brucey has done a great job advocating for the bill and kind of leading the coalition, at least from my perspective. Um, so thank you for that. I think it's an important bill. I do agree with Rep Rogers. Um, but I do, uh, I do strongly support it as well. And I know the select board here in Arlington took a vote in support of the bill as well. Question. This is really for both reps. When you get a chance to vote on climate legislation, will you agree to participate in a standing roll call vote, each of you? And how do you bring that about? And this is to make the votes transparent, obviously. Sure. Because I think we want to know who really supports these bills. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I always do that on an environmental stuff. The, the real trick is, though, to get it to the floor at all. <laughs> In other words, by the time, and I always, I, one thing I've learned is that we'll have amendment, an amendment strategy. Oh, we're going to file this amendment, file that amendment. But by the time it gets to the floor, it's been through committees, it's had policy analysts, lawyers, countless people have looked at it, it's pretty fully baked. I can tell you now that I'm chair of a committee, I, I put enormous time into, into crafting the bill in, as best I can, working with lawyers and policy analysts. Now it's on the floor and Sean wants to amend it. I'm the chair, it's my bill, came out of my committee, and another representative wants to amend it. Hold on, time out. <laughs> Why, are, what is your idea? I've been working on this for four months. What do you want to do to it? And so the, the amendment strategies often aren't successful because people who had a hand in crafting it don't want the bill changed radically at the end. So what I would say is um, the real fight, the real advocacy happens long before a bill gets to the floor. And I tell that to some of the newer members who get elected, well, we'll file this amendment. We'll no, go talk to the leaders in, of the committee or senior leadership now. By the time it gets to the floor, the, the fight's mostly done. You're not going to get many big amendments on the floor of the House. I don't know if Sean has a... Any. I, I, don't, I don't necessarily necessarily disagree. Um, but what I will say is if the bill is good, meaning if it comes out of committee and amended on the floor, if it's a good bill, I will stand for a roll call. If it's a watered-down bill that has been presented by a utility company, basically, I won't stand for it. But if it's a good bill that I believe I'm passionate for, I will absolutely stand for the roll call. I just what do you think the chances are of any of those bills making it out of ways and means and Yeah, you know, 
Especially the environmental justice. Yeah. That's the one I love. I have to say, I, and Sean should weigh in as well, um, um, I've given up predicting what will happen in the legislature, <laughs> even though I serve there. Well, maybe particularly because I serve there. Um, yeah, so I, I, I will say, uh, maybe many of you heard me say it before, I don't know, that um, Otto van Bismarck famously said, if you, if you like sausage and respect the law, don't ever watch either one of them getting made. <laughs> um, you know, there, um, there are bills I thought didn't have a ghost of a chance that have, are now the law of Massachusetts. There are bills that I absolutely thought should be law yesterday that still are not. It is hopeful that they've already in ways and means, because that gives all of us a chance to fight that much longer. And um, there, is a, there is a growing movement. I mean, the, 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 make no mistake, the energy, the enthusiasm, the number of representatives who don't, frankly, come from Arlington, Belmont, Cambridge, who are hearing from Fall River and Chicopee, who are hearing more and more. So there's, there's good momentum. Um, but Sean should also. I don't want to follow Otto Van Bismarck. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would associate. You know, my feelings with Rep. Rogers' comments. I, I think he uh, makes an articulate point. Um, I would just go back to the point that um, we need people to push. We need people to advocate. We need all of you to be in the State House, in the halls, flood our emails, flood our phone calls. You know, every rep has coffee hours. Show up at a coffee hour. Have a conversation um, with your representative, with your senator. Um, if, you are pa if you have a friend who's equally as passionate, based on your question, right, um, have them go to a coffee hour and meet their representative um, face to face. Remember, they work for you, not the other way around. So. Thank you all so much, and I don't want to cut off more questions are still going, and hopefully people can stick around and we can talk about um, uh, we do want to briefly speak about more actionable items. You talk when people mentioned very, and it's a very important point, talk to your friends in other districts, talk to people, bring that, have them bring in. But uh, Tabo was going to speak to about three specific actionable items that she's going to talk about. Thank you. Okay. I'll make this quick because it's 8.30. Three things. So we know that renewable energy is in telecommunications, utilities, and energy. Call the chairs. Call Barrett, call Golden, the chair and the vice chair. Tell them to vote it out favorably. That's one. Environmental justice bills, they're both in ways and means. You can call those chairs as well. You can ask your reps, which we don't really need to. But you know, if, you're, if you know someone that has a rep in another area that's a friend of yours, say, hey, can you, do you mind calling your rep and asking them to put a little pressure on ways and means? I had a meeting recently with their attorneys in ways and means, and I can tell you that we really hit hard on environmental justice amongst the other bills that, were, that are in um, ways and means. But also, the other one that's in TUE is the carbon fee. So if you want to call Barrett and Golden on those two, have them voted out favorably. Can you give mm -hmm. a number? Yes, yes, I can. All right, so if you want numbers, so you've got, so the um, carbon bill is H2810, Driscoll, it's the Driscoll bill, formerly known as Benson. You've got um, the renewable energy, 100% renewable energy bill, that's House Bill 2836, Senate Bill 1958. You've also got another one that's in TUE, no, it's in, I'm sorry, it's in the Transportation Committee. And that is the NAC to advance modern sustainable solutions for transportation. That's H3008, Senate 2106. Transportation, transportation. transportation Committee, yep. And the environmental justice bills, one is House 826, Senate, and the other part, Senate 453, and the other is House 761, Senate 464. And so lastly, Mass Power Forward does educational forums on climate legislation and lobbying. So if you have a friend that's in a town like Springfield, we will go there and we will hold an educational forum on climate legislation and teach them how to lobby. We will go anywhere in the state. 350 has 18 nodes, so we, we are you know, pretty <laughs> far reaching 
and we work with Mass Power Forward to make those education forms happen. We 350 is also ramping up their 50C4, which is means that we are going to be not only endorsing candidates, but working for climate champions. So look out for that. We have a sign-up sheet in the back. Um, if you want a Mass Power Forward forum, or you know somebody that does, and you just want us to reach out to them, please sign up for the back there on that table there for the 350. You'll see it's a sign-in sheet. And if you want to get any updates with any further lobby days going on, please sign up. So that's all I have for you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, our panelists. Thank you, everyone, who helped put this together. Thank you, the audience, very much. Uh, like Abel mentioned, there's numerous literature in the back, tabling and sign-up sheets. If you want to follow up, this is great. Thank you all for coming.